So you want to make pixel art like a pro, but you don't want to spend 7 years practicing like poor little old me. This video will be a very purely mechanical overview of what Asprite can do for you, starting with the very basics and ignoring some of the less useful stuff. By the end of the video, you'll feel comfortable with Asprite's tools and understand what some of the more important ones are. In future videos, we'll be diving into how to use these tools effectively, but for now we'll just be covering how they work. So I keep throwing around the name Asprite. If you bumped into this video, you may have already settled on Asprite as your software of choice and are looking into how to get started with it. But for those of you who are still trying to choose what software to use, I highly recommend it. As someone who's used it for literally thousands of hours, yikes, I really think it's the best pixel art software by a long shot. Since it's designed with pixel art specifically in mind, it has a very clean and optimized workflow, and it makes animation so much easier. I used to do all my animation in Photoshop and wanted to rip my face off, but downloading this was a godsend. So really, pause the video and head on over to Steam or their website to pick it up for 20 bucks. Now I hear what you're saying, whoa there Mr. Watt Designs, I ain't got that kind of fortune laying around for software that lets me just place boxes, I've got a family to feed. Well, not to fear, Asprite is somewhat open source, so you don't need to take out any loans. If you're a tech nerd or you're just good at following tutorials, you can get a slightly old but still 100% functional version for free. If you do this, I highly recommend you eventually buy it someday to support the creators, but if you just want to give it a shot, the developers aren't opposed to people compiling it themselves. Just follow the tutorial from this reddit post. I'm not gonna lie to you, it seems a bit difficult and I've never done it personally because, well, I bought it, but I believe in you. I'll link it in the description below. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let's open it up and see what we see. You'll first be met with the main menu. Here you can either open an old file or create a new one. Let's create a new one. We get hit with some options here, but you only really need to worry about the width and height. This will set the width and height of the canvas you'll be drawing on. Kinda obvious. Just pick RGBA for now, you probably won't need the other color modes, and I personally like a transparent background. If you want a white or black background later on, you can just add it yourself in like 2 seconds, so. Set your height and width to 32 by 32 or something and let's get going. Okay, so here we are. You're met with an abundance of stuff and it can be a bit overwhelming at first, but I'll go over all the important stuff that you actually need to care about. So first off, on the right we have all the tools. Do I ever actually go over and click these like some sort of chump? Absolutely not. They all have hotkeys that are pretty useful, so I'll just keep a running list as we go along because hotkeys are hard to memorize and I don't want you clicking them like some sort of weirdo. First off, B is for brush. If you hit B, it'll select the brush tool. You may notice this bar up top changes and we get tons of options. Whenever we select a different tool, it changes up, so we'll go over what each tool can do. With this first box, you can change your brush size. This can also be accomplished by holding down control and using the scroll wheel on your mouse. If you're using a drawing tablet, I recommend going to edit, keyboard settings, and setting up some sort of shortcut for your drawing tablet thingy because it's handy to change your brush size a lot. We're going to skip some of these other options and head on over to this pixel perfect checkbox because it's important. When I draw a curvy line without it, you'll notice it's all thick but when I check the box and use it, it makes the line all thin and nice. It avoids bunching pixels together and tries to string it into a fancy line. I'll go into more detail in a future video, but generally you want to avoid these clunky looking lines up here, so it's a very cool feature. I know some other artists kind of hate it, but I think it's one of Asprite's nicest features. I'd advise turning it on and trying to get used to it, but hey, do what you want. It's definitely kind of awkward at first. These other two boxes will allow horizontal and vertical symmetry, which is very handy. If you're drawing a face or something else symmetrical, it can be very useful since you don't have to go back and forth editing both sides. You can also move around the line of symmetry like so by dragging the white thingies. And guys, one more thing about the brush tool that I never see anyone do but you absolutely should. If you place one pixel and hold shift, it'll automatically create a cool line for you, and you can just click to finish the line. This is insane and super useful. You can make complicated shapes really fast and not have to waste hours placing pixels. Next up we have the eraser tool. If you hit E for eraser, whoa another hotkey, you can bring it up quickly and start removing pixels. There isn't much more to talk about here, it erases stuff. It also has most of the same options as the brush tool. Our next tool is the handy shape tool. This can be selected by hitting the U key, you know, U for shape I guess, I, I don't know, but you can place rectangles instantly. And if you hit shift U, you'll see on the right here it changed from a rectangle to an oval. It'll now place circles and ovals. If I handed you the brush tool and told you to go draw a 20 by 20 pixel circle, you'd probably take 10 minutes and hate yourself, and I would too. But the oval tool does it in seconds. If you're dragging out your oval and hold shift, it'll force it to be a circle. Same thing with the box tool. You can hold shift mid drag and force it to be square. Very handy. Next up we have the marquee selection tool, which is probably what I use the most besides the brush. It has tons of uses, and I'll go over just a few of them here. First off, you can hit M to open your box marquee. You can then drag to select a chunk of pixels. If you messed up your selection, you can carefully line up your mouse with the edge of the weird, hypnotic, glowy line until the symbol changes, and move it a bit. 
Then from there you can drag the center of the box to move it around or hit delete to delete it. You can also rotate it. It's a bit annoying because it can be hard to line up if you want to do like an exact 90 degree rotation, but luckily holding shift to make it snap to 22.5 degree increments will give you nice clean rotations. As you can see we have a recurring pattern of the shift key making things more straight. That's something useful to keep in mind. So what are some handy uses for this? Say you drew a portrait but you made an eye too high. You can select the eye and drag it down. Or you can select something and delete it. You can also copy and paste selections, which is useful when you have lots of repetition. If I had lots of little flowers on the ground or something, I could just mass produce them. This can be accomplished even quicker by selecting something and, before you drag it around, holding control. And then when you drag, you'll drag a copy. But if that's too much to remember, just do good old copy paste. You'll maybe notice that when you select an area and then try to select another area, it'll forget the old one. What if you want to select a bunch of different things? Well, you can either go up here and click the Add to Selection button, or you can hold Shift as you select. You can also remove from a selection by holding Alt Shift or hitting the Subtract from Selection button. Also, say you don't want your selection to be a perfect box. If we want a circle, we can either hit Shift M or go over here and select the Circle tool. The lasso is important as well, which can be reached by hitting Q for a uh, cowboy? With this we can wrangle up our pixels with custom shapes. I use this very frequently. And finally, the holy grail of selection tools, the magic wand. This can be reached with the elegant and sensible W hotkey, or the box over here. This will select any pixels of the same color that are connected to the one you clicked. Say I have this drawing of a ball and I want to shade the bottom left of it to make it look dark. I can hit W and select this color, then carelessly draw with my giant brush tool where I need to. It kinda acts like a sort of mask. Even cooler, you can come up here and turn off the contiguous box. This box is limiting the power of the wand, and it can only reach its true potential once the check mark has been removed. When set to contiguous, it'll only select the adjacent pixels of that color as we just saw. But when you unclick the box, it'll choose any pixel of that color anywhere on the drawing. You can then paint over them, or remove them all, or do whatever you want. Say I have something like this, and I want to put a shadow under where the roof is. I can select all of that color, and brush over it with a darker color. Bam! Instant shadow. There's some better ways to do this, but this is quick and dirty, and I use it a lot. One last thing. Say you want to select all the green here, but it's only picking up the exact hue of green you clicked. You can essentially lower the wand's standards and have it tolerate slightly different colors. If you raise up this tolerance value, it'll make it so it discriminates less harshly in its color choices. It's nice to finally see some tolerance in pixel art software these days. Okay, so that's enough about the selection tool. On to the eyedropper. If you're using a tool that has a color, like the paint bucket or the brush, you can hold down Alt to get the eyedropper tool. Do not be a loser and go click on the tool over here, you're wasting valuable seconds. If you then click on a color, that will be your new color. It acts just like any other eyedropper tool. Also note that you can have two colors equipped at once, just like Photoshop. With the brush tool, you can left click to do the foreground color and right click to paint the background color. Same with the eyedropper. Eyedropping with left click sets your foreground color and eyedropping with right click sets the background color. Not super useful, but if you find yourself changing between colors a lot, it can be handy. Next up is the paint bucket. Very useful. You of course hit G for a goopy mess to activate it. This will fill in paint anywhere in the area. Much like the wand tool, you can increase the tolerance of stuff it'll paint over. You can also choose whether it's contiguous or not. This will choose whether it will fill out the pool of color or every pool of that color. I personally really like using the lasso tool to select an area and then using the paint bucket tool to darken or lighten all the selections. Just a neat little trick to help shade things a bit faster. A sprite also has a super handy grid feature. You can go to View, Grid, Grid Settings to set how far apart the grid lines are, then toggle it on and off with Control Apostrophe. This is especially useful if you're making a game or something with tiles, and have lots of art in one file. I like to draw new characters in one big file with all the other characters, and since the characters need to fit in a 32x32 32 32 box, I like to turn on the little grid option to make sure I don't mess up. The next tool is slightly more advanced, but is very fun to use. Say you look at your art and realize, ah dang, I sure wish that roof was less bright and obnoxious. Well, luckily you can select an area and hit Ctrl U to bring up a color editor. You can then change its hue, saturation, value, and transparency by dragging some sliders. Made a slime enemy and want him to be blue instead? No problem! This is also handy for shading at times. You can decrease the value and slightly change the hue to get a really nice shadow after selecting the portion of the drawing that you want to be dark. Another cool one is the outline tool. If you ever want to outline something quickly, you can just hit Shift O. This will outline whatever you have in the layer, and you can choose how the outline is formatted. You can make a regular outline by just doing the adjacent four boxes, or you can make a thicker one by also including the four diagonals. You can then adjust the colors here and generate your outline. Our last tool is more of just a hotkey, but I'm going to go over it anyway. If you select something and hit Shift H, it'll flip it horizontally. 
and if you hit Shift V, it'll flip it vertically. This is nice for moving stuff around quickly and avoiding repeating work. As you can see, my workflow relies a lot on moving things around, getting clever with selections, and stuff like that. I don't even really do a lot of single pixel placing, it's a lot of tricky line work, pasting and adding curves and stuff. Yours doesn't need to be like that at the start, mine certainly wasn't, but I just want to make sure you have all the tools available to you at the beginning. So now let's explore the next portion of Aceprite now that we've mastered all the tools. First up is this little layer and frame tab. If you don't see it in your Aceprite window, hit tab and it'll pop up. Right now we have just one layer, but if we add in another layer by right clicking and hitting new layer, or hitting shift N, you'll quickly see how this works. It's just like any other art software. If we draw something on the top layer, it'll obscure the thing beneath it. We can double tap a layer to make it somewhat transparent if you want, maybe for like smoke or something. You'll see here that these little circles indicate contents of the layer. We can actually select them and copy them to another layer. Remember how we could hold control to copy and paste selections by dragging? We can do the same thing here. If we hold down control before we start dragging, it'll copy and paste the layer contents. We can delete contents of a layer from here too. We can also lock them to prevent us from accidentally messing up, and we can toggle whether they're visible or not. If you want to move a layer, you can either cut and paste, or you can select it and hover over the little yellow line until the move tool appears. Then you can drag it to another layer. I just blasted a ton of layer stuff at you, but the moral of the story is you can delete and move them around really easily. You'll also notice that we have the option to add some frames. I'll go into more detail in a later animation video, but we can hit Alt N to add a new frame. Let's add a few, and change up what's in each one. I'll draw this simple ball animation. When we hit enter, it'll start cycling through the frames as a little animation. We can do this with multiple layers too, and that's what makes A-Sprite so powerful. Here we can see in this Attack on Titan drawing, I have tons of frames and layers. One layer has the Titan's head, one has the body, one has the smoke, etc. You may think, oh my god, what a masochist, he's got hundreds of frames, but most of them are just the same four copy pasted over and over again. Again, I'll go over this in more detail later, but I promise it's not nearly as hard as it looks. Alrighty, on to the next window. This over here is the palette window. Selecting colors is hard, and we'll have a video that covers that, but luckily palettes are here to save the day. Pixel art tends to look good with less colors, so sticking to a small palette can be really helpful. When I started, I stuck with a 32 color palette because I was scared of running out of colors, and I think 32 is a good starting point. I did a drawing a day for 500 days, each with a 32 color palette. You can find a nice starter palette by clicking this little folder icon. This shows all of Ace Bright's starter palettes. You can find more on lowspec.com for free if you don't like these, but I'll cover that in a later color tutorial. Go ahead and search for the EDG32 palette and just go with that. Probably a good choice to get started. If you ever want to add colors to it, you can just pick your new color. Say we want to add this putrid obnoxious yellow. You'll notice this little red exclamation mark in the bottom here, indicating that the color is not in the palette yet. You can click that to add it in there, and then you can move it around if you don't like how it's positioned. You can then save this new palette somewhere if you like. As you first start though, I imagine you won't really need to be doing this. So speaking of that little color selector down there, this is where we can choose our hue, saturation, and value. If you don't like this view, you can change it to be a color wheel or spectrum or something, but I like the default. You can see sliding around on this little rainbow here will change our hue, and then we can change our saturation or how juicy it is by dragging from left to right, and then going up and down will change how dark it is. This brings us to our next window, the preview window, which is more of just a handy thing to have. You can hit F7, or you can go up to View Preview to open it up. This allows you to preview what it is you're drawing from a distance. Sometimes when you're all smushed up in the pixels, you can kind of lose focus on what it looks like from a distance, and realize it looks hideous once you zoom back out. To avoid zooming in and out over again and making your time lapse look like you're bouncing on a trampoline, you can set up a little preview window to look at. This is also handy because you can set this to plain animation by hitting the little play icon. That way you can mess with just one frame and see how it affects the overall animation. You don't need to keep pausing and playing over and over again. So I highly recommend you get used to having that in the corner of your screen. Next up, I wanted to quickly go over some common misclicks that result in confusion. Sometimes you'll hit Ctrl F and wonder why your faithless windows have abandoned you in your time of need. Ctrl F puts Aceprite into full screen mode, and while that's useful, it can be very confusing if you do it on accident. So just hit Ctrl F a few times until everything is back to normal. You may also hit Shift S at some point. That makes everything snap to the grid, which I think defaults to every 16th pixel or something. Luckily the developers realize this is weird and put a little button here to press in case you forget that shift S can undo your crimes. And then lastly, if you hit tab, the layer panel goes away. If you have tons of layers, this can be handy since they take a lot of screen space, but it can be confusing if you forget. So just remember, hit tab to bring the layers back if you ever accidentally make them disappear. Okay, so say you finally made a drawing or animation and you're ready to export it. Well, first off, since we're working with tiny little pixels here, exporting a tiny little drawing is going to be confusing to the computer and it'll try to blur it for you. 
We do not want that, so we usually scale it up, at least for regular drawings. Sprite art for games is usually different because your game engine probably expects small pixel art. But anyway, if you have a regular drawing you want to export, hit File, Export. Then you can give it a name. It'll automatically choose a .gif format if you have an animation, and if you have a single frame it'll choose a PNG. This is probably okay as is. You can then choose how much to scale it up. This depends on where you want to post it. The maximum width of an Instagram image is 1080 pixels. So say your drawing is 100 pixels wide to start. If it were 10 times bigger, it would still be under the maximum and still be big enough that it wouldn't blur. So we'll just make it 10 times bigger, which is 1000%. You could probably get away with 5 times bigger or 500% too. It's not an exact science, you just don't want it to be mega blurry. And it depends on what you want your end file to be. You can choose if you want it to ignore any layers or frames and how you want it to animate. You can also choose this export for Twitter button. This button just adjusts animation to avoid some problems that Twitter has with putting an invalid delay on the last frame or something. If you aren't exporting an animation, it probably doesn't matter. Let's click export and go to our exported PNG in a sprite again. You'll notice if you zoom in on what was once one pixel, it's now 10 by 10 pixels. This is because we exported it to be 1000 times as big, which is 10 times bigger. So when we open this in Windows or on Instagram, it will not be blurry. Now let's say you're exporting an animation as a sprite sheet instead for your game. You can go to File, Export Sprite Sheet, and choose all the details you want. This will depend on what game software you're using, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail here. But basically it'll put each frame together in this format so you can have your game engine pick it apart and take each frame one at a time. So that everyone is my introduction to A-Sprite. I know I kinda blasted a fire hose of information at you, but hopefully some of it sticks. I know starting pixel art is daunting and there's lots to learn, especially without an art background, so it's okay if you don't remember all the little tips and tricks I threw out. In my future videos, I really want to focus more on how to learn on your own and develop your own style without having to follow a ton of tutorials, so make sure to subscribe and like this video if you want to see more. I'd also like to get some feedback regarding future videos. Are there any topics you really want to see? Just let me know in the comments below. Of course, don't be afraid to check out my little pixel art indie game, Clean Up on Isle Goblin. It's still in production, but that's my main focus these days, and it'd be great if you'd want to check out one of the devlogs or maybe take a peek at the Steam page. But anyways, I hope you found the video to be helpful. Thanks again for coming by, and see you next time.